Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome by the second installment of our 5G webinar series. Tonight, we'll be discussing 5G ecosystem applications. Before we start, just a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SRE YouTube channel, SRE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SRE website under the events drop-down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received a CPD validation number from EXA. I would like to introduce you now to our host tonight, is Mr. Gomoto Setapelo. He is the chairman of the SIE Events and Media Committee. He is also a registered professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa, EXA. He's a chief engineer at ESCOM and he's the chairperson of the Telecommunications Study Committee of ESCOM Steering Committee of Technologies. Mr. Setlapelo is a senior member of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and serves on the Executive Committee and Council. In 2017, Mr. Setlapelo was awarded the SIE Keith Plowd and Young Achiever of the Year Award. He has also been listed on the Mail and Guardian Top 200 Young South Africans for 2018. I hand you now over to Mr. Setlapelo. Thank you very much, Minx. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> welcome again uh, to this 5G webinar series. Um, just like to add to what Minx had said, that the hashtag for this event is hashtag 5G SAIE. It will, will link you to other events and material that the SAIE has presented or has organized on, on 5G. I would also like to implore those that are not members to become to register as members of the SAEE uh, by either going on our website, that Minx has said, www.saiee.org.za, or sending a request uh, via email to reception at saiee.org.za. And those members of the SAEE that have an interest in telecommunications uh, would like to implore you to join the newly formed SAIE telecommunications section. You can request to become a member via reception at saie.org.za or send an email to Gerda Gea at Gea G at saie.org.za. With that said, I would like to present our first speaker. Mr. Eric Wanjala. Mr. Wanjala holds a Bachelor of Technology degree in electrical and communications engineering with over 10 years of work experience in information communications and, and technology, ICT. He's a registered professional engineer with the Engineers Board of Kenya, EBK, a member of the Institute of Engineers of Kenya, a member of the Fiber Optic Association and Fiber to the Home Association Africa, the FTTH Council. He holds various professional certifications and training in fiber optics and telecommunications engineering with various certificates in management through the management through the managemental training at Harvard Business Publishing USA. Mr. Wanjala. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Engineer Eric Wendler, and I'm presenting on the title Ecosystems Africa Case Study, that is uh, specifically on deep fiber driven models, enhancing faster development of uh, 5G by the African utilities. Uh, briefly, the uh, presentation 
we'll have a simple intro and then I'll do a typical African utility case, then the 5G ecosystem, then the capabilities and the opportunities in the African utilities, opportunities and gaps that is in the African utilities, the areas of collaboration for the 5G that is uh, for providers and utilities, then a brief on the utility telecommunication model, a case on uh, a Kenya Power Lighting Company, then the recommendations uh, in that order. Now, uh, an introduction, uh, as it is right now, utilities are currently having common challenges, if not uh, uh, opportunities as well. And these are ranging from uh, the drive to do better service delivery, increase revenue opportunities, that is for profitability, and uh, manage or reduce operational expenditures, reduce on the losses, that is commercial, technical, and probably uh, improve uh, customer satisfaction, notwithstanding the uh, reduction, probably on the total cost of ownership for the various assets. So going for the best and for the most optimal. That is currently uh, the, the position for most of the African utilities as in operations. Now, the upgrade to 5G technology uh, envisages a different horizon. It is a landscape where we are looking at uh, utilities benefiting besides uh, the, the telcos or the mobile service providers. And for the utilities, the benefits are a bit immense uh, with the technology. And it starts with a general improvement in efficiency, uh, the aspect of billing, automations, resource, the optimizations that is uh, for the existing infrastructures, uh, growing of margins, the dawn for the analytics, that is uh, the data analytics, big data and such, and generally lowering of the business risk, which now will uh, culminate from the entire ecosystem of the benefits from 5G. Uh, as delivered on our utility network. Now, 5G is expected to go a little beyond uh, the 4G, and it's going to generate not just the people-to-people -people interaction, but also the machine-to-machine -machine interaction, that is the platforms for IoT, and that is where most of the benefits for the utilities are being envisaged. And as uh, uh, displayed, the, a typical utility has this kind of uh, characteristics, Generally, we are operating in over-regulated spaces, high capital uh, outlay, monopolistic environments or tendencies. Then we've got bureaucratic processes. And then we have got, got some that are too critical for the utilities, which run from the high OPEXs, low margins, aging infrastructure, commercial and technical losses uh, that is bedeviling the African utilities. And uh, that is in general. And, uh, for the 5G ecosystem, which happens to be one of our framework discussions this evening, uh, generally we've got uh, the electrical in the ecosystem, that is the interaction model. We've got the electrical, the manufacturers of the components, which are electrical in nature, chips and wireless. We've got the radio, we've got the network of manufacturers that Uh, colleagues, since we have lost Eric, we're trying to reconnect him. Please bear with us. Apologies for the technical glitch.
Perhaps, uh, my apologies again, uh, colleagues. Um, perhaps uh, while we try to get Mr. Angela back, uh, could we start with the other presenter, Minks? Thank you. Um, apologies once more, colleagues. Uh, just to the presenters, perhaps let's also just switch off. Uh, well, with the introduction, you can switch on your, your, your camera and then you can switch it off to try to save some bandwidth. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter is Mr. Sean Laval, who is a, an executive for solutions and innovations at SquidNet, South Africa. As the innovations and customer solutions executive at SquidNet, Sean is responsible for driving technical innovation within the organization and advising customers on strategic technical decisions to enable key business outcomes. Sean has an extensive experience in both hardware and software development and has led and has held and has held senior positions in companies operating in the telecommunications, mining, security, and tracking industries. Having operated in the wireless machine to machine and to M system development industry for over 10 years, Sean has a wealth of knowledge and information on traditional IoT technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sean Laval. Thank you very much for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Right. Uh, can can you see that? Um, what's all? Affirmative. Thank you, Sean. You can see that. It's perfect. Great, thank you very much for inviting me to this platform this evening um, and for that introduction. Um, so, so as, as mentioned, I, I do work for SquidNet, so I'm part of the solutions team at SquidNet. Uh, just a brief um, note on who SquidNet is. Um, we operate a national radio network um, across South Africa, which is focused primarily on uh, IoT. And what I want to achieve in this presentation this evening is just positioning where we see um, the technologies being used in terms of the utility sector um, and the broader IoT sector in the context of 5G, but also where we're seeing other technologies come in as well, uh, which are complementary to 5G, and where one would look at selecting um, each of those technologies. Uh, today, we have over 100,000 water meters um, on our network um, actively being um, used over our radio network. So we do work very closely with um, utility providers and, and contractors to the utility sector. So great, let me proceed. So effectively, you know, what we need to be aware of is that IoT devices, and I've categorized the utility sector as a subset of IoT devices, really have different kinds of data requirements to to how we traditionally use data in terms of our phones, in terms of our computers, which are very downlink intensive, they need high bandwidth. Whereas in the IoT world, most devices, uh, in fact, the vast majority of devices require less than one megabyte of data uh, per month in, in order to be effective um, in, their, in their primary task. To give you an indication, if, if you had a tracking device, for instance, they needed to send one message every 10 minutes that uses just over one kilobyte per day. So what we've done effectively in previous years up until recently is um, we would, for instance, use 2G networks. We would open large pipes, large data pipes of uh, 115 kilobits per second and then send a few bytes over it and then close it. Very inefficient in terms of energy, very inefficient in terms of bandwidth and cost. And what we've seen is some evolution in that space. Um, quite rapidly, particularly over the last five years. And what we have is the, sorry, let's move my screen to the bottom. Um, so what we have effectively is several different technologies that, that we see in the ecosystem that is addressing a multitude of applications from the utility sector through to uh, logistics, tracking, security sector, and what we have here is a depiction of where these technologies fit in. So right at the top there, we have 
5G, 4G, 3G, your traditional cellular-based technologies, very good for high bandwidth, very reliable communication, um, but they are costly. They, they do consume large amounts of energy, not always optimized for, for instance, the utility sector, where sometimes it's very cost sensitive, um, it's very power sensitive if you start thinking about things like water meters. So other technologies are also required. And just below that, we have uh, LTE category M. So that's then using the same infrastructure that's been deployed for 4G, but different kinds of um, mechanisms which make it slightly lower power, but still using the same infrastructure. And then we get to the, the bottom three tiers, which really are focused towards things like the utility sector. So in the middle there, we have narrowband IoT, which is an offspin of the LTE standard. And effectively, this when we start to talk about 5G in the utility sector, we're largely talking about narrowband IoT. Um, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail during the presentation. So this is the 3GPP's answer towards low power communication, many years of battery life, and also optimized cost in terms of both the hardware cost as well as connectivity costs when it comes to things like the utility sector, but not limited to the utility sector. And just below we have um, then LoRaWAN and SIGFOX. So those bottom two are what are known as proprietary IoT networks. So they don't require license spectrum and in fact don't work in license spectrum. And they, they these networks are deployed in a different kind of way and optimized towards extremely low cost hardware, low cost connectivity, but with its own uh, benefits and drawbacks, which we'll get into during the presentation. So this gives a, a, a good overview of the connectivity ecosystem um, as we see it, both in South Africa and globally. So what is a low power wide area network? So we spoke about NBIoT, LoRaWAN, SIGFOX. To some, you may be familiar with this term, but to others, it may be the first time that you've come across it. And effectively, this diagram here positions it quite nicely with respect to technologies that most of us are more familiar with. So if we look at the y-axis, we have range um, or transmission range. On the x-axis, we have power consumption, which translates then into battery life. And up until recently, about the last three to four years, if one wanted to deploy a solution nationally without deploying one's own radio infrastructure, the only options that were available were the traditional cellular networks. So your 2G, 3G, LTE, 5G would, would fit in there as well. Very good for high bandwidth communication, uh, has a lot of good uses when it comes to IoT, but it does have some drawbacks. So one of the drawbacks are that it is very power intensive. So these networks are not designed for many years of battery life. And they're not optimized for low bandwidth communication with, um, with the cost benefits that come with it. So where you have things like water meters, particularly that are being deployed, the cellular technologies, the traditional cellular technologies are not optimized for that. Just below that, we have Wi-Fi. It's a very good short range, high bandwidth communication medium that most of us are probably using right now, but also very power intensive. And then in the bottom left, we have things like Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy. But what's never been available until the emergence of low power wide area networks is this top left hand quadrant where one can effectively today get Bluetooth type power budgets or battery lives with national coverage in the order of the cellular networks. And that's opening up a wealth of applications that either weren't feasible before or weren't possible before. In the words of Andrew S. Tannenbaum, um, the great thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. Uh, and it's no different in, in the, the space of low power wide area networks, which is a good thing because it does show that this is a quadrant that is here to stay. And there's various different technologies that are competing in this space. And I will focus on two of them in this presentation. NBIoT being the offering from the traditional cellular world uh, through the 3GPP, and then SIGFOX, which is the proprietary technology that, SIG, that uh, SquidNet operates. But all of these, technologies, all these low power wide area offerings all pivot around the same core features. And that is low cost connectivity, 
providing long range communication with long battery lives, so very low power. And of course, reliability and security are, are core to this, um, given the kinds of applications that are being used in the millions when it comes to IoT networks, uh, be it utilities, be it uh, security, certain be it recovery. Security is, is key to these technologies. So if we break up these IoT network technologies, we can break it up effectively into two different types of networks. So on the left, we have what's known as a synchronous network. So this is your, how your typical cellular network will look that we're all familiar with. So you will turn on your cell phone, your cell phone will search for a, a base station. The cellular network will assign the tower that it wants to communicate with that phone, and then it will establish a synchronous connection. It's no different with your traditional machine-to-machine -machine cellular based devices. They, they work exactly the same. Very good for high bandwidth communication, um, very good for reliable quality of service, it's licensed spectrum, but it has its, its drawbacks in the fact that because it has to be uh, scheduled, it has to be synchronized with the network, the device itself can't just go to sleep when it wants and then communicate when it wants. If it goes to sleep, it then has to reconnect with the network. And then that process is very power intensive. So not optimized for for battery life, long battery lives. Um, and also, as the device moves away from the network or closer to the base stations, the power budgets do change. Um, so that's one of the features of, of cellular based technologies is it does adapt the power budget and, and the transmission power based on proximity, which is, is critical for maximizing spectrum, very good for um, high bandwidth communication. But sometimes that's not ideal when it comes to IoT type communication. So to give you an example, in the water sector, what we see manufacturers doing with their water meters is they build inherently some redundancy into their communication. So whenever a water meter sends a message, it will send the, the latest reading, but it'll also send the previous two days readings as well. Because in the water sector, the cost of installing that meter is, is quite prohibitive. And it's critical that they get the battery life that they claim out of that meter to justify the return on investment. So for them, they would sometimes rather miss a message if it doesn't go to the network and then make it up with the redundant message that comes the next day with the previous day's payloads, rather than sacrificing that for higher quality of service, which you get automatically with uh, some of the cellular technologies. So that's a, a, an example of where um, some of the other technologies come in. And it really is on a case-by-case -case basis. So if we look at the other side, which is asynchronous networks, this is where some of the proprietary technologies come in. So this one can think of as, as a large radio net. So rather than the device pairing with the network, the network is always listening. And the device itself will wake up and send a message whenever it wants. That message will get received by every base station in the vicinity and then the device will go to sleep itself. So the device is in full control over its power budget. What the asynchronous type networks also do is they abstract much of the complexity away from the device and bring it into the network layer, um, which is not the case with some of the cellular technologies where because it's a, a higher quality of service, the chipsets are more complex on them. So, so once again, depending on the utility application, each of these networks has its pros and cons. So if we look at 5G, if we talk about 5G and the utility sector, we will largely be talking about narrowband IoT. If we're talking about the kinds of 5G technologies that will be deployed on the utility side, on the metering side. And what we've seen is NBIT has now been pulled into the, the, the 5G standard by the ITU. So it's supported by the um, Evolve Packet Core. And this is their answer then to low power communication. And where we see NBIT being used, um, uh, where we do see it, it will be used is in things like electricity utility meters, where it's not battery powered, it typically has a main supply and it doesn't, it's on mobile, doesn't move around, but it can benefit from, from higher um, data rates, uh, which is sometimes beneficial in, in the electricity sector, particularly when you talk about things like load, load curves, load profiles that they want to send over, over that network. In South Africa, um, NBIT isn't uh, mature yet in terms of rollout. 
Um, so Vodacom is one of the networks that is deploying it. Um, and there's three ways that it can be deployed. So the one is uh, standalone spectrum. So that's how they're deployed in South Africa, uh, where you, you take a 200 kilohertz piece of spectrum and you assign it to narrowband IoT. Of course, in a spectrum starved environment like South Africa, the economics around it are um, tenuous because that 200 kilohertz can be used more effectively for regular users with cell phones where um, the revenue per user is higher whereas the utility sector the IT sector is very much volume driven so there are some economics that come around it as well but we do see this technology will um, grow will become more mature and that's the one way of deploying it uh, the two other ways that it is being deployed uh, globally is in band as well as in the guard band as well which are two two other ways that it can be deployed if we then turn to the proprietary networks, so if you look at something like Sigfox, operates very differently. And in fact, they position themselves as a zero G network uh, because in many cases, IoT deployments and utility deployments uh, do not need high power, but or do not need um, high bandwidth. What they need is they need coverage. They need many years of battery life. They need, it needs to be cost optimized and as long as it can get the critical information that it needs daily or hourly, that serves its purpose. And how something like a Sigfox network works uh, is you can picture a large radio net. So today, as Squident, we operate uh, over 1,500 base stations nationally. And effectively, it's a large radio net that's always listening for messages. And each of these messages is sent in a, an ultra narrow band piece of spectrum. So each of it is 100 hertz in terms of its spectrum width and what that um, translates into is because it's using the ism band it uses the 868 megahertz uh, industrial scientific medical band in south africa it has to conform to certain rules so you may not send uh, more than a certain amount of messages per day but what it does is it sends that message in a very small piece of spectrum so everybody is capped at 25 milliwatts so you may also may not transmit higher than 25 milliwatts or 14 dBm for fair usage. But because it sends it in a very narrow piece of spectrum, that translates into a high power spectral density, which effectively translates into longer range for, for that network. And effectively, the Sigfox network, and in fact, other asynchronous networks, operates on three pillars. Um, so particularly, Sigfox operates on these three pillars, which is frequency diversity, time diversity, and spatial diversity. So how is Thickbox messages sent is it, the device will wake up, it'll send a message, and then repeat that message on a different frequency, and then repeat it a third time on another frequency. And effectively what that does is if there is um, interference at a certain time, it'll get around that in the time domain. So somebody, for instance, opened their garage door. If there's interference in the frequency domain, so somebody, or in the time domain rather, so somebody holding down the, um, a button, a key fob on their car remote, for instance, it can get around within the frequency domain. But the biggest factor that is disruptive that hasn't been available up until now is the third pillar, which is spatial diversity. So because our network picks up each message at multiple destinations across multiple square kilometers, this is also picked up at multiple frequencies across multiple time intervals. There's a, a large amount of redundancy that's built into the network which allows there to be a service level agreement, which we can offer to utilities, even in unlicensed spectrum. So now utilities have the option to use traditional cellular technologies like NVIOT as part of the 5G offering for their deployments that require a higher bandwidth that are perhaps powered. And then they also have the option for proprietary networks where they can deploy it just like they would deploy a cellular-based solution without having to worry about the network layer, but they can benefit from the longer battery lives where data rate is not critical. And this is how we see the utility sector starting to look at their decisions when it comes to deploying the right connectivity on the, based on the, the type of application that they have. So just a note on our, on our coverage. So what we have here is our coverage under SLA. So the red is where we are covered by at least three base stations. And then uh, green is two base stations and then blue one base station. So where you see 
green and blue, it's normally an isolated deployment in a rural area, or it's what we call incidental coverage. So being um, coverage that's, that's actually thrown out from within the core red coverage area. And if you look at what a typical base station looks like on our network, uh, you can see on the right there, it's about the size of a toaster. And one of the benefits of, of things, of Fight networks like Sigfox or LoRa is the cost of deploying the network is much lower than your traditional cellular type technologies. In fact, as, as Squinet, we've deployed our radio infrastructure across the Kruger Park, for example, using just solar based sites with a 3G backhaul um, from, from the higher sites. So it does have a lot of flexibility when it comes to deploying networks where it doesn't make sense for. Uh, licensed type communication mechanisms because they prefer higher density, higher populations to, to justify the cost of that infrastructure. So if you look at the typical flow through something like an asynchronous, or through an asynchronous network like Sigbox, what we have there is we have some example of devices in our ecosystem. So today there are over 900 unique devices within the Sigbox ecosystem. We have a personal tracking device at the top there. We have some security devices on the left hand side, a general purpose um, input device, uh, second from the bottom, which can be connected to, to any water meter that has a pulse output. And then we have an integrated water meter right at the bottom. And then the, the towers there represent our national infrastructure. So the way we deploy our network is in a star of stars topology. So very similar to how a cellular network is deployed. Each base station has its own independence communication backhaul. Uh, to a central cloud um, point. And our primary backhaul is fiber optic cable, and our secondary backhaul is normally 3G or LTE. And how it will work is the devices will wake up, they'll send a message. That message will be received by the nearest base station within the vicinity. But simultaneously, that message will also be received by every other base station in the vicinity. So I mentioned at least three in terms of how we deploy our network, but typically within urban areas, you'll find it being picked up by six, seven, eight base stations simultaneously at three different frequencies. So a lot of redundancy built into it. Of course, only one repetition is passed through to the end customer. So they don't have to deal with handling all those repetitions. I mentioned that the devices have full control over their sleep cycle, and that's critical to getting the return investment, which is um, so important to the utility sector where the devices not only have full control over when they send the message, but the uh, link budgets are very predictable. The power budgets are also very predictable because they don't change based on the proximity to the base station. So very good when it comes to predictability uh, and um, longevity of that, of that battery. From there, we have our dual backhaul connectivity to our central Sigbox cloud. And that's where the authentication will happen, where data routing will happen, any decryption will happen if it's an encrypted message, decoding as well. And ultimately that then gets passed through to either a on-premise service or one of the hyperscale platforms that our customers may be using, things like Amazon Web Service or Azure or Google Cloud. You can route that data wherever you need to go. And then of course you can also route it through to end applications, whether that's a graphical user interface or it's a SAP Oracle based system, you have full control over where that data goes. And then you can also send data back to the devices. So you can change settings on the devices. You can actuate valves within that device. Um, you do have that flexibility over the network. Because it's an IoT network, it is optimized for uplink traffic. So in terms of the Sigfox network, you can send up to 140 messages per day from the device to the network, or roughly one message every 10 minutes. And then back to the device from the network, you can send up to four messages per day to the device. So optimized for uplink traffic, but you do have the option for some downlink traffic to the device as well. So if we look at some example of some of the utility uh, meters that are being used today. So these are all locally designed and manufactured uh, in South Africa. So what we've seen is many of the traditional utility meter manufacturers in South Africa have um, seen the benefit of this technology um, over the last two to three years. And they've invested uh, significant resources into evolving their products to speak to the Sigfox network through SquidNet. 
And for them, it really is a game changer because they can now start to deploy smart meters nationally without having to worry about deploying their own radio infrastructure or having to worry about uh, drive-by um, logistics or walk-by logistics. They can now get all the benefits that electricity meters have been getting through things like the GSM network over the past decade, but now applicable to the water sector uh, with all the benefits of long battery life. And typically we see these meters lasting anywhere from five to 10 years of a single battery, depending on how often they need that data to, to be transmitted. So to summarize, if we just look at where some of the differences, some of the benefits and drawbacks of these technologies are, if we look at the 5G offering through something like Enver IoT, uh, very good for your higher data rates. We see that being used uh, most likely extensively in the electricity utility sector. Um, they can send higher load profile data. Um, they can do firmware over their upgrades, which is a benefit of the technology. Uh, it has guaranteed quality of service operating in license spectrum. Um, but of course it is, does have higher power consumption and the hardware cost is also higher and because it's a more complex chipset. Uh, the, the cost of that hardware will inevitably be higher. And we see that uh, at the moment it's, it's significantly more than $5, but uh, eventually the cost may come down there. Um, and at the moment, coverage is a challenge. So uh, that may or may not be resolved um, in the coming years, um, but it certainly will find its place in the utility sector. That's our belief. And then if we look at something like Sigfox, very low cost in terms of the hardware, uses very simple chipsets that have been amortized over over two decades, uh, similar to the kinds of chipsets that are used in garage door remotes or in car key fobs, doesn't require complex hardware, uh, very low power consumption. It's optimized from the network down to the protocol to be optimized for low power, of course, sacrificing high data bandwidth uh, to get that. Um, but it does today have extensive national coverage through SquidNet. Um, and we are seeing commercial deployments in the utility sector. Um, as we speak. What I didn't mention as well is it's also very resilient to jamming, so not so much a concern in the utility sector, but it is very beneficial to things like the stolen vehicle recovery sector, where because it's an asynchronous network, it doesn't need permission from the network before it speaks, uh, which is effectively the, the uh, basis of radio jamming, where the receiver itself is jammed in a vehicle, for instance. So that device can never hear the network and it can never speak if we think about something like GSM. Whereas in a Sigfox network, the device itself just wakes up and sends, it doesn't need permission from the network. So we are, we are seeing the technology being adopted by multiple verticals, which has a benefit for the utility sector as well, because what we operate is an open access network where the costs are amortized across multiple sectors. Um, and the utility sector itself doesn't have to bear all those costs itself. There are some drawbacks, of course. So you are limited to um, lower data rates, uh, limited to 140 messages per day, which is fine for the vast majority of IoT applications. Um, and in terms of communication, you, you can't communicate immediately over, over a Sigfox network down to the device. So the device itself can choose to communicate whenever it wants to. It has full control, but you can only respond to the device as a response to the uplink. So for instance, if we look at something like a water meter, the water meter will say uh, it detected a leak, it'll wake up, it'll speak to the network. And then once the message comes in immediately, the network can say, okay, shut the valve off. But you can't just open a port to the device like you can, for instance, in, in some of the GSM technologies, which has its benefits and its drawbacks. So Sigfox is not optimized for um, immediate control applications uh, where you, you have to initiate uh, communication to the device, but in the same time, it has a built-in firewall. So um, you can't hack a Sigfox device like you can, for instance, some of the TCP IP based um, devices. So I hope that this has given you an overview of how we see the utility connectivity landscape, how we see it uh, on the ground today, um, and giving you a broader overview of some of the options that are available uh, today and into the future in South Africa and globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Laval, um, for an informative presentation. Um, colleagues, you're reminded that you may post your questions on the questions tab.
uh, both our and just right to whom the question is directed. Um, and we shall then do Q&A at the end. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Eric Onjala, who's an engineer at the Kenya Power and Lightning Company, PLC. Mr. Onjala holds a Bachelor of Technology degree in Electrical and Communications Engineering with over 10 years of work experience in information communications technology. He is registered as a professional engineer with the Engineers Board of Kenya and is a member of the Institute of Engineers of Kenya, a member of the Fiber Optic Association and the Fiber to the Home Council in Africa. He holds various professional certifications and training in fiber optics and telecommunications engineering with various certificates in management through the managemental training at Harvard Business Publishing in the USA. Mr. Anjala, let's try again. Thank you very much. My presentation is on Ecosystems Africa Case Study, Deep Fiber, uh, Deep Fiber, I mean Deep Fiber Driven Models, Enhancing Faster Development of uh, 5G by the African Utilities. Uh, looking at uh, looking at uh, the 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 African uh, development in terms of uh, uh, broadband connectivity and adoption. We've not been uh, in the best of uh, lens, although there's been appreciable efforts by the telcos to realize a connected Africa. And therefore, this presentation has been premised uh, on what is it that we can do uh, to benefit or to optimize existing investments in form of assets held by the utilities and uh, the collaborations with the telcos to realize a faster uh, transition to 5G, if not uh, a mobilization to the same in a cost effective manner. So the contents briefly are an introduction, uh, typical African utility, 5G ecosystem, uh, 5G capabilities and opportunities, opportunities and gaps, areas for collaboration with 5G uh, providers and utilities, then the, the utility telco model, then I got a case for Kenya Power and Lighting Company PLC and uh, briefly the uh, recommendations therein. Now, uh, introduction are that utilities uh, are, tra are currently uh, uh, driving at improving on efficiencies, growing the margins and, uh, and, uh, and minimizing the losses and uh, trying to achieve the best customer satisfaction available. However, within a very strong regulated space and uh, the, 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 the competition that is coming in uh, from all over the place, most of the utilities tend to find this a hard road to deal. And therefore, this presentation will not only focus about the technology in there, however, it will also look at the cross uh, institutional collaborations that can also enhance opportunities for diversification and uh, probably what the next level of uh, an African 5G scenario should be. 5G changes the landscape, improvement in efficiency, that is for billing, automations, operations, resource optimizations, uh, growing of margins, introduction of a new dimension or a paradigm to data analytics to drive the decisions. And finally, the 5G brings in a new dispensation that besides interconnectedness of people, that is to communicate, it also delivers machine to machine platform for communication that is under the IoT. A typical African utility has a kind of a characteristic like the one displayed here in, and you'll find that uh, besides the, uh, the traditional issues of uh, over-regulation, monopolistic bureaucracy and all that, there are the threatening uh, aspects of uh, the characteristics as well, where we are having the high technical and commercial losses, aging in infrastructure, and uh, such kind of uh, uh, happenings that actually are facing the African utilities and thereby hindering on how uh, the development or the growth of the same can be harnessed. Now, uh, 5G has an ecosystem and uh, the ecosystem for 5G comprises largely about uh, four main players, that is electrical, 
who are the manufacturers of the components, radio network and application service providers. And each of them have their own roles they play. Uh, besides the technology presenting the benefits of enhanced mobile broadband communication, massive machine type communication, and the low, uh, the, I mean the low delays, that is uh, uh, the, the lessening of the latency within the network. Other uh, benefits uh, of 5G are actually finding themselves home into the utility environment. So briefly, uh, I'll talk about the electrical providers as per the presentation. I will focus only on three key areas which we are looking at for the utility and we will form the framework of the discussion. That is the fiber optic infrastructure for densification of 5G. That is the small sized telecom masts or utility poles and street light poles all of which are infrastructures held by uh, the utilities that have an input or a collaboration benefit for 5G rollout. Then we've got data center and cloud services. We will look at how each one will model into realization of a faster 5G. Then we've got the network providers who do cost-effective development of 5G network through upgrading of existing mobile networks. And uh, the main uh, aspects of the same being the radio access, transport and the core as uh, displayed or as shown in the presentation herein. And uh, the applications provider mainly have uh, three phases, the multi-vendor platform, uh, that is how the applications have to have that aspect. They should be non-proprietary and they should be open source because it is aimed at driving newer innovations envisaged under the 5G uh, model that is now for uh, future growth. And uh, 5G has capabilities and it has opportunities that we are now looking at specifically or domesticating them for the Africa utility. The enhanced mobile broadband, I will not go to the details of which the equipment or the smart metering aspect has already been mentioned and uh, in detail, that's at a technology level. So I'll just mention in passing about the enhanced mobile broadband that is for the firmware, I mean the communications that are in the ranges of one GB downlink and uh, facilitation of uh, uh, smart metering and the security therein, I mean the critical security infrastructure protection and uh, mission critical communications, the low latency that is a characteristic of the 5G that is suited for the new services that are envisaged, real-time automations, remote control and such, breakers and switches that is in the power grid. Then we go to the Internet of Things, that is the massive uh, IoT, now this is where now the other aspects of all the sensors and more embedded uh, devices can be monitored or can be connected using a single a single carrier and we can see the capabilities of 5g delivering it up to 50,000 of them uh, per cell i mean uh, per, 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 per location and uh, the opportunities and the gaps upon which the 5g is creating for the uh, telcos uh, for the power utilities actually are mainly in the area of say how do we capture the benefits of this new technology of 5g to either improve on our existing uh, strengths or turn our challenges and threats into opportunities using this rollout of 5g and how best can the utilities then utilize the same 5g or their inherent uh, potential or capabilities to enhance a faster realization of this. So these 5G opportunities and uh, probably the gaps within the utilities can be largely grouped into like increased connectivity. Currently, Africa's continent has a less uh, access to electricity, just like it has less access for broadband services, as you'll see later. Big data analytics, it's a new dimension which is coming as an opportunity for the utilities to tap in smart metering, diversification, which holds a very key uh, ingredient in the modern day utility. Then we've got regulatory framework, aging power network, SCADA and automation, load management, among others. These are actually some of the potential areas where 5G is expected to create a lot of uh, improvement and efficiency for the benefit of the bigger utilities. Now, utilities in this presentation are not limited to one, we got electrical utilities, that's for power distribution, we got water and sewerage, we got uh, the, 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 the roads and all the utilities, the, the, the public service uh, institutions that do 
for the common good of the public, where affordability and service, uh, high service, uh, quality of service are the key drivers, not necessarily the very high profit margins as in the private sector. So how do we maximize, optimize on the investments? How do we sweat these uh, assets for the best and for a good rolling of 5G? Now, the key collaboration areas between 5G service providers and utilities are the following. I will use a typical example of an electric distribution utility where I'm currently uh, myself working and we've seen uh, some of these uh, benefits or some of these strengths in real time. Besides, I mean, uh, currently we are also even supporting uh, probably amongst our customers, some who are already doing trials or uh, interested in uh, the 5G rollout. Now, the key areas that are actually transformational, which I commend strongly that they have to be looked at in a much more deeper or in a much more uh, attached manner for the benefit of the industry, uh, the lease of dark fibers, these are open pipes that can generate two opportunities, lease of infrastructure, that is open access. And number two, the coexistence of multiple players on a neutral infrastructure provider who is not directly a competitor, creates an environment that flourishes the telecommunications development of which 5G is not an exception. As competitors continue coming, issues amongst the industry keep rising. So. It is one area that has successfully given a good uh, position. We go to collocation data center services. Most of the infrastructure has spaces that can be turned into data center facilities and actually uh, leveraged the surplus capacity for lease to the telcos to develop distributed collocation sites for ag data aggregation, which we are seeing very good in uh, age computing. and. Uh, and, uh, and also when you're doing cross-border cross border connectivity, it is very strategic even to the international gateways. Then we've got reliable supply of electricity. 5G as it's known, it's more energy consuming than 4G or the predecessors, and therefore requires a lot of energy and reliability to get 99.999, such kind of high service availability requires reliable energy. And this model is delivering or envisaging to deliver that. Then the list of wavelength and bandwidth for utilities that would like to light up the dark fibers, create uh, pipes on wavelength or create uh, capacity on bandwidth and still offer them to the telcos or to the 5G providers and then use internally for their SCADA and automations. This is the opportunity we are talking about. Then the priority areas that will enhance this, we got the policy, we got the regulatory and standards, we got the funding, and lastly, we got the implementation. So these are right now the framework areas upon which the continent or the players on the continent and starting with the South Africa leading the, 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 the dimension of the transition and the rest, we can only realize a faster 5G domestication using a focus on these areas that is now running across the entire uh, a group of stakeholders who are in the development space. 5G and the optical fiber technology cannot be unbundled because if they are unbundled, 5G will remain an island. And that's why we are talking about deep fiber. As you can uh, see, uh, a brief mention of the optical interfaces for the 5G, which are currently also being in the study group uh, 15 by the ITU. There is a lot that fiber will offer even beyond 5G, and that will be the best if we were to lay it down to form the transport network access and then push 5G to the users so that we create maximum for the access to the envisaged IoT devices, what a better way. Electricity access rate in Sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see, we are way behind and there is much that needs to be done. And the existing infrastructure plus new infrastructure holds a lot of potential for 5G development. Densification of 5G will easily be propagated on an easily acquired, cost-effective, green compliant broadband infrastructure. And this one is easily being gotten by deploying fiber optic technology in the aerial power networks. Very easy, fast uh, to deploy. That is the reaction times are very fast, both in the pre-implementation and in the post-implementation for support. You get a lot of benefits in this. Now, when you look at, uh, for example, one of the typical initiatives by the World Bank, that is to see how they can make universal access for Africa, 
plans to develop 250,000 kilometers of infrastructure, uh, connectivity of about 250,000 uh, 4G base stations, and uh, probably uh, such kind of uh, a huge uh, investment. A good portion of this, or if the best, if it is uh, uh, developed alongside existing infrastructure, as they choose the locations for the base stations, convert all the new power lines to come with utility telco. Let it come with the fiber optic technology, connect the base station, give it the power it deserves, sync in the broadband connectivity, let the users benefit as we go to another site. Let's not uh, probably uh, uh, delay if we can get it one off. Then the other options of broadband connectivity to the same site will act as redundancy because the aerial option has largely been found to be a lot cheaper and faster and environmentally friendly when it comes to deployment. Anyway, most of the telecommunications will rely on energy and this one becomes a better way. So there are models under the deep fiber based on the fiber to the home, fiber to the cup, FTTX, as you can see in figure 12. And this one is one of the best examples of how fiber can actually act as in an integration broadband infrastructure aimed at creating broadband speeds that are currently not confined into the future. 5G, I repeat again, being one of the beneficial technologies that will sweat these capacities as we progress. Then we have a utility telco model in summary that is in the operations. We've realized 99.99 percent contracts even on uh, least infrastructure. We got low mean time to restore, ease of repair times. We got ease of visual fault location when you're doing aerial surveillances and all that, faster service launch. On the development aspect, to do aerial fiber per kilometer probably is almost a third of an equivalent underground. And this little or this low costs of uh, infrastructure development are the ones that are carrying affordability to the end user, what we are currently advocating for. That is the least total cost of infrastructure ownership. Already acquired waylifts to do power line carries an extra benefit, such that when you deploy the broadband network, you don't need an additional acquisition of waylifts as will be for the alternatives. The faster deployment aspect, the green compliance, and the integration of a, of a, of, of a power uh, of a fiber optic infrastructure onto an existing power line, the cost is almost a tenth of a power line, for example. And therefore, you'll find that uh, uh, to transform a new, an existing power line into uh, a utility uh, broadband will not be as costly. And to do a new one with the uh, integrated fiber optics will even add more value. The costs will be reduced greatly. We got a case for the KPLC diversification. This started about in 2010, and we've seen growth probably uh, significantly among the telcos and uh, the revenues as indicated there. And estimated uh, deployments are over 4,800 kilometers with uh, at least a fast growing uh, collocation space with over 39 sites. We are currently connecting all the uh, the, the international gateways, we are currently connecting the regional gateways, and we are actually a carrier of carriers for in the ICT sector, carrying fairly a big component of the uh, ICT sector. And this is not limited because now growing into the 5G space is going to create a lot more of the benefit than envisaged, because there will be demand for more power, which we need to put in our plans, conversion of existing grids to, bro to broadband uh, utility and all new infrastructure to be broadband uh, co co compliant, that would be a good area. So it creates also areas that require further research, technology involvement, like for example, the developers of the electric grid and uh, all the related accessories. This is the right time we see together. How can we make power cables composite even on the last mile, the drop cables, can we have them composite with uh, inbuilt uh, optics and uh, probably reutilization so that we can have least cost of deployment and support and the areas around them? Recommendations as at for the collaborations are that 
for a successful 5G implementation, collaborations are a must. Total cost of ownership must be reduced to the lowest and sustainability has to run in the, run in the spine as we as, henceforth. The utilities have to change and convert their existing massive infrastructure into a revenue or alternative revenue source as they create avenue for rollout of 5G, whether it is instantaneous or gradual, graduating 4G LTE to 5G. Governments and regulatory authorities in this space then have to work together, collaborate, to create a framework policy that will allow this smooth transition and conversions of, of, of the grids. COVID, the current pandemic has shown that the future runs with broadband infrastructure and more data is yet to be unraveled and thrown around for destinations. An infrastructure strategy is required like yesterday. Connectivity or interconnectedness of people and interconnectedness of devices, given the other challenges that have arisen from the COVID-19, telemedicine, telehealth, and all the other subsets will mean this has to start like now, not forgetting the uh, sustainable development goals. They are still there to be met. Mobile service providers to collaborate with the power or the utility players, water, the pipeline, electricity or electric distribution and uh, uh, access for harnessing the current potential, conversion of the existing infrastructure cost effectively to realize the broadband connectivity to densify the 5G. Utilities to deploy optical technology, that is, it will encourage for such. And then we got uh, utilities to adopt a distributed data center services. We got tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four. Tier four have fairly been done, but you'll find that in most African countries, strategies for the lower tiers are still left to, this, to, the, to the users. However, in telecommunication, the best model is that services have to be with the users and to the service providers. An independent, well-funded, low-cost strategy to generate infrastructure creates a more affordable and sustainable enjoyment of telecom services. And this will be one area where uh, utilities can deploy this in their infrastructure and list them out using open access platform for sharing and coexistence. Adopt benchmarking and case studies for the African case, there are so many African successful cases, which the rest of the African uh, nations can benefit from. It's just a stone throw away we benchmark. Development partners, the World Bank, Broadband Communication uh, Commission, ITU, Africa Development, UN and the affiliate organizations, Africa Union, 2063 initiatives, and the UN SDG 17, SDGs 2030. They are more than ever relying or going to rely on this infrastructure or the broadband technologies than ever before. And what a time that this can come. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anjala, um, for a very informative presentation, uh, one that is actually very close to my heart. Um, I, colleagues, I do not see any questions uh, yet in the questions bar. Again, I encourage you to use the questions bar uh, for your questions so we can have an interaction with our our presenters. To kickstart things, uh, perhaps a question to our first presenter, um, <clears throat> Mr. Sean Laval. You mentioned um, the resilience of the Sigfox devices to to jamming. In my head, there's somewhat of a contradiction in that um, Sigfox currently, as things stand, works in the ISM band and would compete with other um, IoT technologies like LoRa. And with because it's ISM, I mean, with a simple Raspberry Pi, whoever wants to create devices can do so. So how in, in, in terms of increasing the noise floor, uh, one, because of other IoT devices around and one deliberately um, sending a signal towards either the base station or, or the device, 
uh, what mitigation strategies do you see in that? Sure, it's a, it's a good question. I think what we'd have to <clears throat> firstly just appreciate is that um, if we talk about raspberry pies and that kind of thing, everybody must adhere to a certain standard when using the ISM band. So already that starts to mitigate how that spectrum is used um, in terms of the amount of traffic that can get sent under what circumstances and the power levels that can get sent at. But of course it is unlicensed spectrum, um, as, as you mentioned. And you know, if you had to use an analogy, it would be the wild west of, of spectrum. And, and that's where things like Sigfox have been architected from the ground up to work in an inherently noisy environment, which is the ISM band. And the reason why the ISM band was chosen is because if we start to look at the, the large scale of IoT devices that, that we see coming through, they really an IoT device at its heart is some kind of sensor that will take a reading from the physical world. And the more of those sensors that can be deployed, the richer the data, the, the better the models that can be uh, created. But of course, it's very cost sensitive. And that's cost sensitive, not just on the hardware layer, but also on the network layer. In a perfect world, I think everybody would like to use license spectrum. That's, that's of course the, the best way to do things, but it is a limited spectrum. It's an ex, or a limited resource and it's an expensive resource. So what Sigfox has done is they've deployed uh, certain mechanisms. So the one is the um, ultra narrow band. So that's, that's quite key in that if, because it has a high power spectral density, if two devices are sending a message at 14 dBm that are right next to each other, because of the spectrum of a Sigfox message is very narrow, a receiver will see the, the um, signal to noise ratio of a, of a Sigfox signal significantly higher than a device that has a wider spectrum that is also transmitting at 14 dBm. So that's one of the ways that it, it mitigates it. But then of course, because it's unlicensed spectrum, it really relies on statistical probability models to get its quality of service. And that's because it's a very narrow spectrum in 192 kilohertz, it can process a lot of messages simultaneously. And because those messages are repeated three times at three different frequencies across three different uh, destinations, you start to get a lot of redundancy built into it. And then statistically, the probability of getting a message is really high, even in an inherently noisy environment. And that's the reason why we can offer a penalty-based SLA on our network. Um, it's a very different way of thinking about networks and it has its benefits and drawbacks. But when we talk about the scale coming into IoT, it's critical that that is in place to complement the, the higher quality of service networks, which you know, are inherently um, higher cost and, and low availability in terms of the, the numbers or the, the the cost of the device itself, um, which which makes sense. It makes sense in a lot of applications where you need that bandwidth, like electricity metering. But it may not make sense when you start to talk about low value water meters or even sensors, things like pressure sensors at, at a residential level. So really it's a case by case basis. But yeah, very good question. Um, capacity is something that's, that's baked into the Sigfox network. And just like a cellular network can increase capacity by increasing base stations, so can a Sigfox network. So if the noise floor does become too high in a Sigfox network, by deploying more base stations, what you effectively do is up the signal to noise ratio for that immediate surrounding um, base of devices. So it has mitigation strategies, just like the, the license type of network deployments have. No, thank you. Uh, quite an informative um, response. Uh, we actually do look forward to having more IoT devices on on our networks in the utility space. Um, colleagues, there are still no questions. Um, I, I do have one though for Mr. Wanjala. Uh, Mr. Wanjala, you spoke of, I guess, the Kenya case study where you are leasing bandwidth, or you are, you are excess bandwidth. It's not quite clear to me whether it's excess fiber pairs or it is in fact traffic that you are leasing out to yes telcos so the, the utelco model that you referred to 
um, what model are you using and uh, advantages and disadvantages of either selling um, traffic or capacity or, or dark fiber itself from, from a Utah perspective. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, we actually started off and we have uh, been leasing the dark fibers. And uh, two things I'll have to say about the dark fibers are that uh, as a telco company, they are driven with time and uh, the speed to deliver services, high quality services at that. Uh, to the customers and they do it with the uh, uh, service level uh, targets or agreements. And uh, as a utility, we are uh, uh, seen as a neutral player. So we are coming in as an enabler. Now that gives us an advantage in this way. If we deploy any fiber optic link between any two points, we have to plan and dimension four surplus capacity to be given to the industry that is under the diversification now the telcos feel that they are safe being carried by a neutral player that is one advantage of the model it creates that uh, uh, homey feel by the the industry that they are being carried by a neutral player least or no cases of, of supportage and visage or whatever number two the predisposition or the deployment of the fiber optic cable above the power lines or within the power grid creates a high security aspect or notion around it. And this deters uh, infringement or it deters incidents of uh, uh, safety attacks or interferences on the infrastructure as shown to other predisposed methods. Now, this also assures the telcos of highly reliable infrastructure. Now, I'll give an example. Like, if you pull or if you install a 48 fiber optic cable between any two endpoints, the utility can use a few number of pairs for internal use, four pairs, two pairs, six pairs, or even uh, six cores if you are to do the strand count. And then the rest of the fiber cores are available for this open access model. Now, there are those providers who will prefer, or they will say they carry highly sensitive traffic and they will want dedicated cores end to end, either on IRU basis, which we do offer, and also on shorter term or on a quarterly basis, which we also do offer. And in the event, there is some capacity on an existing terminal node where probably a lead capacity can be secured, it is also uh, a benefit probably on the internal, that is to the, I mean, uh, for, for, for those who want to look at uh, the, the, the service provisioning uh, between short, I mean, on, on short hops. So you'll find that for the fiber, uh, dark fiber model, it has aided us to quickly carry the entire ICT uh, players, most of them nearly uh, over 80 to 90 percent, we can be talking of the big players or the renowned players. And that model has given a very high service satisfaction going by the uh, view or going by the uh, trend and the service uh, test. Now, when it is a comparison of lit and uh, dark fibers, both of them have their own uh, advantages. The lead services are good. However, okay, they have a good revenue uh, platform and you'll find that the, the, the OPEX can be slightly higher. If you were to compare the two models, that is the OPEX for the lead services and the OPEX for the dark fibers, the dark fibers may have lesser revenues but lesser, much lesser OPEX. So you'll find that profitability for the dark fiber model is very competitive, uh, knowing that even in a utility, the benefits are that reusing existing resources, human resources, uh, the, the energy teams that work on the grids 
are also the same same teams that will work and support the fiber in the operation phases and you'll find that now it might makes it even much more livable and it creates better margins in the long run now there is the other aspect which uh, probably uh, comes in as an enrichment and probably into the future there are models that probably uh, the government or the other private players are coming on board to appreciate developing passive opticals that is passive pawns uh, passive optical networks dedication of now the course all the way to the splitter points and then converging to the users now there are models that are coming in hybrid where now players will not necessarily list the dark fibers only point to point but they want to list dark fibers to the home now for such uh, new emerging models which are also very good for deep fiber and for example the 5g uh, this uh, densification are actually now creating more value proposition because they create now new business models new list uh, areas like uh, uh, collocation aspects and in, uh, in in aerial units where you collocate the splitters and they are also still creating even new operational models some of which are uh, creating a lot of uh, interest that can be looked in because they can also be replicated in telemedicine telehealth and they are also very good for government institutions that are spans of offices away that is in between or interstates and you'll find that now these are the new models which are now coming some of them employ the previous model of either dark fibers and you can list the wavelength if you are doing dwdm and if you want to go down to the bandwidth and then the other scope of the opex now comes in and then these others that are direct dark fibers infrastructure layer one only with the list opex but you leverage on different models to maximize or to switch the infrastructure for maximum margins so it is an issue of uh, choice which is largely also dependent on the service providers preferences there are those who prefer and where you have capacity you provide where you don't have capacity we are now picking it up as a, a challenge to see how we can first uh, develop and this is why it actually optimizes this presentation looking at what we've been seeing and experiencing that utilities should run very fast with the development partners and convert the existing potential into use because when it starts happening the demand keeps increasing and it's very you know frustrating when you cannot meet the demand of connectivity the requests are coming and you really need to deploy faster so it's one good food food for thought that has actually made us to see if we can go to the next stage and uh, now we are also looking into this new area of data uh, managed services collocation data centers and uh, such kind of uh, options no there you go very comprehensive it is encouraging that uh, there is actually a utility on the continent that uh, has moved beyond just concept and is is implementing this model um, i think there's a lot to be learned from from kenya power um there are no questions still on the chat box uh, but i will ask our junior vice president uh, mr pascal Mutasile, to ask his question thank thank you moderator sir uh good evening uh the two gentlemen uh thank you so much for your presentations they were very enlightening let me start with mr laval mr laval sir um Utilities, the utilities companies are technology laggards by their very nature. We sort of prefer a technology to mature and prove itself in the market before we even consider implementing it in our space. And uh, Mr. Wanjala was alluding to like aging infrastructure and legacy systems that we may have in our space. Um, these technologies have been working for many years and you know they haven't really given us much reason to migrate except for technology obsolescence you know the market moves and you know we, we have no choice but to migrate 
to newer type of technologies. So my question is then, why would we consider 5G, uh, given that it's quite a new kid on the block where technologies are concerned for telecoms? Thanks, Pascal. That's a good question. So I think what I would like to just differentiate between is core infrastructure, um, like you mentioned, uh, aging infrastructure, where it is working and there's no reason to replace it. I'd like to differentiate that between parts of utilities that have never benefited from communication. And I think that's where 5G fits in, certainly when we start to talk about the metering side of things. So, of course, 5G it does have its place in the core infrastructure, like we've heard from um, uh, Mr. Wanjala. Uh, but when we talk about the metering side, uh, many aspects have been underserviced. Over, over the years. So things like electricity meters um, have to some extent benefited from GSM networks, uh, which one could argue uh, was a step into the unknown for them at the time. Uh, and what we see now is that happening in the water utility sector, where they've never had a national, never had the option for a national network that can support years of battery life at a cost that justifies the return investment without having to deploy their own radio network, uh, which is, is prohibitive in many cases. So that's why we've seen utilities start to adopt Sigfox, and, and that's really the attraction for them. So there is today uh, no other option in South Africa if you want years of battery life um, without having to deploy localized networks, which has really been the only option that water utilities have had up until now, either deploying a local network with uh, short range proprietary protocols such as Zigbee and that kind of thing with a perhaps a GSM hub, uh, but then you become a network operator. So in some cases, becoming a network operator is core to some utility strategy, but in most cases, it's not their core business. And they now need a certain set of expertise to set up a localized radio network with wireless MBUS, uh, a 3G backhaul. They need a secure site for that, that base station. Uh, they need to have power availability. They need to manage uh, SIM cards. Um, it needs to be um, inaccessible to unauthorized personnel. So it becomes a different kind of business uh, for utilities. Um, or they can start to do things like drive by or walk by, which they do in many cases, but that has its own ongoing logistical complexities. So what utilities have, utilities have seen in, in our experience is the opportunity that presents itself, where now they can benefit from an open access network um, without having to become radio experts. And they can concentrate on their own core business with a technology that is relatively new, but just like GSM was relatively new 10, 15 years ago when utilities started to use it. But I think it's important that utilities use technologies that are standardized. So if they are looking at networks, it's one of the first things they look at is, is it a, a standard that, that is uh, open to a certain extent? Is it a standard that um, is, doesn't lock them into one particular vendor? And that's one of the things that they Find really attractive about open access networks like Sigfox, you know, like LoRaWAN in, in some parts as well. Um, and that's opening up a new type of horizon for utilities, particularly progressive utilities who now are not only looking at metering, but starting to see the benefit of having real time data, which they can now start to use to pass on to their consumers and start to change consumer behavior. So when you start to have hour by hour information coming from your water meters that you can give your consumers access to, they start to immediately have visibility of leaks. They start to have day-to-day um, -day visibility of their bill, so there's no bill shock at the end of the month. Um, and that starts to then translate into uh, less non-revenue uh, water, it starts to translate into higher payment percentages um, or less instances of non-payment. So in the progressive utilities that we've seen, it's not just about 
the technology and the new way of billing. It's also about how can this start to change the behavior of the consumers and drive revenue into the future. Okay, thank you so much, sir. I would like to latch on to that point that you mentioned about um, utilities actually perhaps focusing on their core business. Uh, Mr. Wanjala, let me ask this to Mr. Wanjala. Uh, should utility companies consider establishing the utility telcos model or would you say they should just focus on their core utility services and leave the, let's say, 5G to the cellular service providers? Mr. Wanjala? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, the, 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 the response to the question, the good question, is uh, uh, utilities have a core business, as you rightly put it. 5G uh, requires a much more focused uh, business uh, and technology focus because 5G will also have its own uh, uh, changes or technology upgrades and all that. Now, utilities can, can only deliver best in terms of service uh, expectations, customer centric, centricity, and uh, profitable margins in a good way if they focus on their core business. However, they can make alternative revenues or diversification revenues by aiding the telcos to realize the kind of reliability they need in their 5G space. The, 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 the cost of implementing 5G within a, tel within a utility space and running it as a utility may have more than one items in terms of administration, management, cost, capex investments, and the day-to-day -day management of the core business vis-a-vis -vis the 5G, which is also involving, unless the utility has a lot of resources that it is not intending to run the 5G for, for, for profitability, but just for enhancing its internal uh, operations or, or automations which will be an uh, overkill in my view because 5G has been designed to operate slightly above or to operate beyond what 4G can deliver in terms of capacity. So in my view, it will be a more profitable model or a, collab a better collaboration uh, between utilities and uh, the telcos to enable the telcos uh, get a list total cost of ownership because telcos suffer a lot when it comes to infrastructure cost. That is what hinders telcos from giving more affordable uh, services to say because a lot of the uh, upfront investment or the capital I actually goes into infrastructure acquisition. So if infrastructure acquisition, which is largely commanded by connectivity, can be taken up by utilization of existing infrastructures to reduce the total cost of infrastructure ownership, then carry that benefit and hand it over to the 5G providers using the densification uh, strategies of deep fiber, that is push the fiber closest to the desk, then hand over to the wireless. Then they will form a faster access to the people. Because 5G, if I got or I get the technology right, it's about enabling connectivity to the data sources, sensors, the people in the connection. Now, if that being the case, then it is much better if it is closer, localized. And this can be done by using high capacity connectivity through optical optics. So to the telcos, or I mean to the utilities, they can have different models of coexistence. It can be a subsidiary. They can get special private vehicle arrangements, partnerships with telcos or in other institutions, and then come up probably with a dedicated unit that will be handling telco business separately. Otherwise, the, 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 the current model of dark fibers is easier to handle within a, tel a utility as a division, as a department, because it is mainly focusing on infrastructure that is being used by the 
utility for internal operations, which largely has a lot of confidentiality, and knowing that data is very sensitive. So there is every reason uh, the dark fibers and the connectivity they are in for SCADA, for billing and such, meter management and all that, to be within the confines of the company. However, enabling the, 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 the telcos to get services to the users using an affordable infrastructure and technology, in my view, becomes a much better uh, role that utilities can play. Partnering, partnering to lease capacity to the telcos and uh, probably developing other models which now the telcos can benefit on, like uh, creating for them uh, spaces to lease data centers, the low level data centers for data aggregation, facilitating redundancy in terms of power at the collocated sites, and also provision of, a, a, in this case, like particular, the internal towers, like the, the towers that the utilities develop for radio communications or emergency communications, all the surplus spaces within these towers can now be utilized by the telcos on lease models to now carry the services to the users cost effectively. So in my view, the utilities should only should come in strongly for 5G and any other technology as enablers for affordability and sustainability to be migrated to the end users. So the services that will be de delivered by the telcos will not necessarily have that expensive component of connectivity mm -hmm. at the infrastructure layer. Yes, that is it. Yes. No, uh, very informative, uh, gentlemen. Um, the, we have gone slightly over time. Um, I think this this is a very topical discussion and happening in many utilities uh, across the world, not just in Africa. So yeah, I think there is scope yes. for us to to have further discussions and looking at why uh, open access type of infrastructure or type of models and and regulations. But I think we need to unfortunately. Uh, end this webinar, we, we, we shall look at, at, at scope for, for, for future uh, topics in, in various other, um, yes, topics within within the utility uh, telecommunication space. Um, to the attendees, thank you very much for attending and allowing us to go slightly over time. This presentation, as a reminder, will be uploaded on the SAE TV YouTube channel. Please make sure you subscribe so that you are informed whenever a new video is uploaded on that channel. Please also make sure that you follow our LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter pages uh, at SAIEE for any for other information that uh, we will be sharing with, with, with the public. Just again, a reminder that we have a seven uh, episode series. The next series, episode three, will occur at six o'clock. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, communications and an invitation will go out again via those channels and via email. Uh, please attend these sessions. We are applying uh, for continuous professional development points for those that are registered with EXA. So thank you once more to the organizers as well as to the presenters and to you for attending. Good night. Thank you, sir.